be prepared, you've missed that opportunity, so. Well, I can say that certainly if you were making pasta by hand, you would eat a lot less of it. Yep. <laughs> it's a heck of a lot of work. So I think that, um, uh, one, I want to start preparing our volunteers here for our laughter session. Are there any of you out here who are willing to help lead some of the laughter as we move into it a little bit? Han and anyone? Feel it? There's a few of you. Do we have any certified laughter trainers here? Do we, do yes. We have how have any, anybody's certified taken laughter workshop? Certified. So uh, um, just get, get yourself ready because in about uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to call you up to have you help, help <laughs> do this with us. We just want to see how the experiment goes on this Good. one. So, um, so the, one of the questions that's been coming up a lot, it's in the New York Times, it's been in the Wall Street Journal, is uh, centered around kids and food and sort of setting boundaries and barriers with food. There's this current trend of saying that the French eat better, they organize their children better to have proper meals. Um, and then there's this uh, story of a, a mother and her daughter in Vogue magazine, and she's been pilloried for putting her daughter on a, a diet and establishing food boundaries for her, saying uh, a lot of people are saying that's, that's not the American way, you know, not having cupcakes at birthday parties. How do you guys feel about that? I, I, I think as a parent, it was my job to monitor what my children ate because I monitor what they wear and when they sleep and what they watch and who their friends are and whether what they read and whether or not they're reading and eating was just a part of that responsibility. Um, I think given their druthers, I know that my children would have eaten a lot more sugar and a lot more potato chips and Coke and if we had them in the house and we chose to keep them out. I, I'm not sure what the um, story is about the woman in Vogue and having, um, putting she, her daughter on a diet. Is she, she putting put her, her on a diet? On a or diet and they, they, they sort of called her a tiger mom for, for not letting her have a meal if she ate too many calories that day or not engaging in the birthday cupcakes at the school or having more treats and really setting meals and, and uh, snack time boundaries around her. Um, and then there's a dialogue that says the French are teaching their children to eat more proper food or more vegetables early on, not leaning into uh, children's food as opposed to real foods. You know, well, the whole idea of, of special food for children is rather peculiar and, yeah. and distinctly American. Um, I think we're going to be faced with very hard decisions in this society, probably other societies too, because they're all going to catch up with us. Uh, we've heard some very depressing information in this conference in the past couple of days, uh, particularly the extent to which we are prisoners of victims of our own biochemistry. Uh, and that once people start to get into patterns of being overweight, the chances of getting out of that are very, very slight. Um, and we, the pressures on kids today to eat the wrong kinds of foods are very great. Uh, we've heard that the obesity epidemic is now becoming a matter of national security, that we can't find enough lean people to serve in the military. So, you know, this is going to be, and the amount of money that we are going to have to spend to deal with the consequences of these poor food choices is going to bankrupt us as a society. So at some point, I think we're going to be forced to look at some very, very tough possibilities. Uh, one of them is the possibility of banning all advertising of the kind of food that is driving the obesity epidemic today. You can imagine the screams that will come from uh, the food industry if such restrictions are imposed, but it may come to that. You know, maybe we have to look seriously at putting taxes on soda, for example, um, and other junk foods. And that is a strategy that's worked with cigarettes, you know, that one of the few strategies that's worked. If you get taxes up high enough, it discourages young people from buying them. Um, if there was one, you know, it's such a mess. It's such a huge mess. And it's so hard to see how we can even you, you use that image of a, a huge cruiser ship that we're trying to turn around. You know, the momentum involved is so great. How do you even begin? I think if I were, if I were king, uh, the one thing I would concentrate on is sugary drinks. 
You know, that, there is no need for them in human nutrition. That is a major piece of the puzzle that's driving childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. If we could eliminate that one thing, that would be huge. That would be an am amazing first step. And I would do it, I would think I would ban advertising of them, I think I would tax them. I'd like to make that go away from our society. I remember when my daughter was very young, she was, I think, four, and she was in preschool, and she, the teachers were, were very ambitious in what they want, wanted the kids to do. They would take them on long walks, which was great. And I was the attending parent on one of these long walks, and it was really hot, and they were, you know, the kids were like this, and their legs were about this big, and they were trudging along and sweating, and um, wh when one of them said, you know, I'm really thirsty, and the teacher said, when we see that tree over there, which was not very far away, when we get to the tree, we're all going to sit down and have a nice glass of water. And they all said, okay, and they went over to the tree and sat down and had a nice glass of water, and about a couple of days later, my daughter came into the kitchen when I was at home, and she said, Mom, may I please have a nice glass of water? <laughs> and I thought, you know, that worked. And if, if it were water instead of Coke, a nice glass of water instead of a nice glass of Coke, kids would be perfectly happy, I, I mean, to, to, to a certain extent. But I, I do think that that actually works to um, tell stories and, and uh, make things exciting for kids and fun um, through storytelling and language. So I think part of what you were saying in your uh, happiness research is, is uh, maybe we don't have to ban advertising, but we just have to shut off our televisions or walk away from the news. How much in, in your research did you find that that was going to be helpful in increasing happiness? Oh, I think that's huge. Uh, I mean, the whole issue of how new media and new technologies of information uh, dissemination and communication are affecting our brains, I think that's a huge question. Um, you know, this is, an, again, an unprecedented experiment that we're in the midst of. Um, I, I think that a lot of this stuff, internet, texting, email, uh, I think it tends to fragment attention and undermine mindfulness. Um, it certainly encourages multitasking, and the research is very clear that the human brain can't do more than one thing at a time. At best, it can learn to switch rapidly back and forth. You can get good at that, and probably kids growing up on all this are much better at it than I am. Uh, they're probably also better at hand-eye coordination than I am. Uh, but I think there's downsides that may be very great. Um, I observe a collective decrease in attention span in our culture. Uh, I think all people I know who teach observe that as well. Um, one way I notice that is that um, I don't watch a lot of television, but when I do, I'm, I'm very bothered by the rapidity of scene cutting today, uh, which is much different from when I was growing up. And when I watch movies that I grew up on, the scenes are so much longer. When I try to show these to my daughter, uh, who's now 20, she finds them boring. Uh, they don't move fast enough. Uh, I think many people today have the sense of time going by so fast that we, never, we can never catch up. That cuts into the cooking stuff. Um, and that's a real change. You know, I, I've often heard it said that uh, as you grow older, time seems to go faster because each moment that you live is a smaller fraction of the total that you've lived. Uh, but I was very surprised to hear my daughter when she was about 13 say that she had the experience of time going very fast. You know, she said that Christmas comes around like <laughs> and, and that's not my experience when I was her age. Summer vacations were endless and Christmas seemed, you know, very long from one cycle to the next. You know, I think more is happening per unit of time today. Uh, we're exposed to much more stimulation and it creates this subjective sense of time passing very fast. You know, and I, I used to have time to read a lot. I find I often don't, you know, I, I have much less time to read. Just too much is happening. So I, um, I live in San Francisco and I, I recently deactivated my Facebook account. I uh -huh. logged off based on Andy's book and <laughs> saying to step away. And my friends turned around and said, you're very brave. I thought, I thought, well, there are many things you could be brave about, but logging off Facebook is not one of them. The, the other thing I did based on your book was I threw away my microwave. Uh -huh. 
And I threw it away to slow me down, and I learned something really interesting about food. I learned that with a microwave, you'll reheat, and the leftovers aren't as good, but without it, you'll transform. You'll, you'll take the cold potatoes and turn them into something else because you need to pull out a pan. And the act of transformation, when you slow down, is actually quite helpful in the food process. It's much more meditative. Very, very surprising. However, someone just told me, and I have not tried this, I guess I've tried it in limited ways, that a fantastically easy way to cook wonderful vegetables is to cut them up, put them in a dish, and cover them with a wet paper towel and microwave them for maybe three or four minutes, and they come out perfectly. And all it takes is a wet paper towel, so you might want to get your microwave back. <laughs> and especially, <laughs> especially since so That's many people Craig's complain about for. vegetables that this is a big problem, that they don't know how to cook them, and it takes too long. So this is something to, I advise you to experiment with. What do you think, Jody? Well, I know that um, people swear by corn that way. Yeah. Actually, leaving, do they leave it in the husk? So yeah. I, I don't use a microwave because I really like the process, and um, I know how to cook vegetables. But I do know that that makes a lot of sense. That that's one of the comments that we hear over and over again is that people don't know how to break down a vegetable. It takes too long. It's um, you know to cut up a vegetable. So worth a try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Jody, I have to ask, um, how many of you guys watch Top Chef? A handful. I, I've always found it a fascinating thing to watch because it's, it's extreme cooking. It's cooking in this sort of most absurd way I've ever seen in my life. And can you just share a story or two from what your experience is sure. like? Sure. Yeah, I think it, it's probably going to be on my gravestone. Of all the things that I've ever done, being on Top Chef Masters is, is uh, the thing that people ask the most questions about. It was, an, um, it was as uh, intense and time sensitive as it's presented. It was, fortunately I was cooking and competing with a lot of my peers who I respect tremendously and I was able to um, compete to raise money for an organization that I cared about and I had chosen Partners in Health. So all of that wa was um, positive. It was um, stressful, it was crazy, um, and it was a game. And I had to remember that because really while I was cooking, I was just thinking about doing, cooking the best food that I possibly could and not that it was a game. So if somebody's, you know, onions were burning next to me on the stove, I would move their pan off the stove. But that's not being a very good player because then their onions don't burn, and maybe something of yours does. So um, it, was, it was great fun, um, quite crazy, and uh, I was really glad that I did it, and I'm not sure that I would do it again. I think, I think that Top Chef's on a lot of people's gravestones. I saw Nathan Nervold, uh, who was uh, chief scientist at Microsoft and was, wrote a book on molecular gastronomy at TED, and I said, Nathan, I really enjoyed your appearance on Top Chef, and he said, Nobody remembers anything else about me except that I was there. So I think if you want fame, the message is go on <laughs> Top Chef, no matter what you do. Um, so I'm going to call up the, the laughter folks because I, I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes sort of getting ourselves organized around this and then go to questions from the audience. So prepare your questions. Um, if the, the people who are willing to help us do laughter, come on up. And maybe, Andy, you can explain a little bit about this. Uh, sure. Um, Laughter yoga, or I prefer to call it laughter therapy, uh, was invented by a physician in Mumbai, India named Ma Dr. Madan Kataria. Uh, I've met him, he's a friend. Uh, I just wrote a foreword for his book. Uh, he was fascinated by reports in the medical literature of people who had laughed their way to good health, often from serious conditions like autoimmune diseases. And one of these accounts that became popular in the rest was Norman Cousins book uh, from some years ago. And in the medical reports of this, laughter um, is usually induced by telling people jokes or having them watch funny movies. The problem with those methods is they wear off with repetition. So he, Dr. Katari was interested in seeing whether there was a way of 
inducing laughter that would hold up over time. And he made a very simple discovery, which is if you get people together in groups and have them simulate laughter, the laughter rapidly becomes real. Real meaning that you recruit the involuntary nervous system so you can't stop it, you gasp, tears run from the eyes, in extreme cases you fall on the ground and drool. So, uh, and that has to happen. I mean, for, for this to work, it has to become an involuntary phenomenon. So he started uh, laughter clubs, which rapidly spread throughout Mumbai and then through all of India, in which people anywhere from 10, 20, up to several hundred or a thousand would get together in parks in the city, and there's a leader. Uh, they begin with some physical warm-up exercises and some breathing exercises, and then simulate laughter. And this is now spread around the world, and if you look up the site uh, laughteryoga.org, you can find lists of these organizations. Really, in every city and town in the U.S., there are now uh, laughter clubs. And I think the potential uses of this are great. There is not much hard science that's been done on it. A colleague of ours on our faculty just did a, uh, a, a one study of looking at some uh, physical measures and outcomes measures. Uh, some research has shown that this lowers serum cortisol, that it stabilizes blood sugar. I think there are profound physiological changes and I've proposed, I'm, I'm really trying to organize some serious research on this using it for things like PTSD, for example. But it's a lot of fun. It's got no downside and it's got everything to recommend it. So, so we've, we've never done an experiment like this before at a public forum. So you guys are all part of the the uh, inaugural class of laughter as part of the public forum program. So Andy, what do you suggest we do here? Do well, why don't we ask some of our uh, experienced laughter people what they would recommend to start? What do you guys recommend? Should people be seated? Should they stand? Should they? Why don't you start with some clapping, okay. That's very good clapping. But with laughter yoga, when I'm leading a laughter yoga session, it's a very particular, special type of clapping. Dr. Kataria talks about as you're clapping, you're using your hands and you clap very flat so that you're stimulating all the acupressure points on the fingers. So you make kind of a loud clap. There we go. So it's not like an applause, it's just a nice clap. There you go. And now there's actually a specific rhythm that goes with the clapping exercises. So you can see that laughter yoga, what we're doing is we're involving some playful childlike activities. This is going to help to lead to that spontaneous uh, laughter that Dr. Ed Duell is talking about. So here we go. We're going to go one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. And then we finish by going, very good, very good. So it looks like everybody's got the clapping down. So the next step is to get some chanting into this. And it's very particular words. It's going to be ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. 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 Very good. Very good. Yay! So it looks like everybody's doing a pretty good job with the clapping and the chanting. So let's take it up another notch, OK? Let's add in some movement. This is another key component to this laughter yoga is movement. And it kind of ties in with everything else. So it's going to look like this. It's going to go ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. So let's give that a try. Let's see how that works, OK? All right, here we go. One, two, three. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho. Very good, very good, yay! So that is a basic warm-up exercise when we're leading a laughter yoga course. That just kind of gets, uh, kind of breaks the ice and gets everybody sort of comfortable. You can look out and see all the smiles on people's faces as we're going through doing this. The next step is some laughter yoga exercises. So you might be wondering, well, what, what's a laughter yoga exercise? Are we going to be doing yoga poses like downward facing dog while we're laughing? No, not at all. What it is is we're actually incorporating ancient yogic breathing exercises and incorporating modern just laughter and sort of combined. That's where the idea of laughter yoga comes in. 
So I don't know if there's, do you guys have any experience leading laughter exercises? Do you have a favorite one that you want to lead? Yeah, the milkshake one. You know, this one, Dr. Kataria talks about this one. When they're over in India, they, this stemmed from making chai. If you've ever been over in India, they're making chai on the streets, and they're mixing it up and pouring it. And so what this one will, uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is as we're doing these exercises, usually it's in a group, and we're all making eye contact. That's very important for whatever reason to really get that sort of contagious laughter you have to be watching different people laugh. So you're going to watch up here. We're all going to be smiling, laughing. You're going to be smiling, laughing. So it's really a fun group activity. So on this one, the way it looks, you're going to go, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so let's give it a try. Everybody ready? Make some laughter milkshakes. OK. Here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. Ah, ah. <laughs> Let's try that again, okay? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> very good, very good. Yay! That was excellent. Maybe let's do one more. One of my favorites is cell phone laughter, okay? Now, one of the ideas with laughter that we teach in the laughter yoga classes is that laughter is so important that um, you should be able to do this whenever you're feeling stressed or just needing a boost or whatever. But you might be in a public place, and it might be sort of embarrassing just to sit there and, and have a really good laugh to help raise up your mood. And so that's a nice thing about the, the <laughs> invention of the cell phone, right? So all you need to do, you're having to just imagine this with me for a moment. You're having a really bad day. Okay, and you just need a good laugh. So you can just pick out your cell phone. You'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but now, since we're all in a safe environment, and that's the other thing about laughter yoga is when you form laughter clubs, it's, it's all your friends, you know, this is a safe environment. It's some place that you feel comfortable laughing. So what we're going to do is we're not going to use our cell phones. We're going to use our hands. And this is our laughter phone right here. Now, if you actually did this out in public, you might look kind of funny, right? But here in a safe environment, it's very safe. So pull out your laughter phones and just pretend you're carrying on a conversation. And then you're just going to start laughing. So on the count of three, here we go. One, two, <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> back. Um, so thank you again. That was awesome. Big hand. Um, thanks for our volunteers for coming up to lead. So we'd love to take some questions from you guys now. Um, there's a mic up here in the middle. So if you have some thoughts, uh, questions you want to share or ask, um, come on up to the mic and um, we look forward to hearing from you. I know you won't be shy in 10 minutes when we're trying to shut down, so hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was really fun. The laughter? Yeah. Yes. That was really fun. It reminds me of the, the, the belly game. Yes, exactly. The same thing. Yeah, I love that. Hello? Okay. Um, my question is in, re in relation to time and um, other cultures and the amount of time that they may have to cook and how you feel that that relates 
to their health, and I'm talking about work week, time, and things like that, I, I, with your knowledge of the other cultures. Mm. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get off at 3.30? Yeah. And have well, I think, I think that um, actually what lots of people do in various cultures is to incorporate cooking throughout the day. So let's say, and you can do this <coughs> here. Um, if you know that you don't have a lot of time, you can start cooking something in the morning you can, or part of the meal in the morning or part of the meal on the weekend and freeze it and um, or just refrigerate it. Grains freeze really well. Um, so you can make big batches of grains and sauces and things like that and condiments. So I, I, I think it's about time management and planning well. Slow cookers are great. Yeah. You know, we can throw things in them, go away, and let it cook all day, and it won't burn. So there's some, there's some interesting, um, there was a meeting of major food manufacturers who were talking about moving some of the Hispanic population from traditional slow-cooked beans and rice and other things into a fast food, and they were using their uh, teenagers and children to do it. And the way they were doing it was saying, you need more time in your life, you're busy, you're a contemporary modern person. And I think that some of the questions that are being raised now is, is that really what a contemporary modern person would do? Or is it, um, or is it saying, I'm, I'm taking time to do that cooking, that's part of my self-care, my well-being, my meditation, my practice, as opposed to treating it as a chore. And it, this seems to be this sort of common thread that's running through um, the discussion and certainly through your book, Andy, is sort of like, what is your practice that's going to help you bring about um, happiness? And, it, and I think that is the, the boat being turned around. I don't hear very much about home economics or cooking in school anymore, but I've had two daughters that have gone through a Waldorf-inspired uh, school situation where the making of the cornbread every day remains one of their favorite memories of that activity. We do lots of cooking with our kids at home, but is there any hope for a return to learning how to cook in any other setting other than home? I was really annoyed in junior high school. The boys and girls were separated. Uh, the girls got to go to home economics and make cornbread and brownies, and I had to go to wood shop and make a broom holder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to learn how to, how to cook, and that was, you know, boys weren't allowed to do that. Uh, totally silly. Um, also, I've always said that uh, I think the reason that nutrition always gets so consistently slighted in medical education, I mean, constant, always swept under the rug, is that to the academic medical mind, and I think really I should say to the male academic medical mind, nutrition looks like home economics. And it's not taken as seriously as pharmacology and biochemistry and what's seen as like the hard stuff. So again, that's a cultural, cultural attitude. I think that if we all ask for home economics and ask that kids learn how to cook, um, then that's when things will start changing. I think it's up to us to, to push be, to I think it would be great to have that in schools. Yeah. For, well, for also, <laughs> the, if, if when kids cook, then they know what they're eating, um, it makes so much more sense to them, just as it does for an adult. And if I, I think that it's actually more than just home economics. I think that teaching food should be incorporated throughout the day in um, all of, you know, as much as possible so that there's stories behind the making of food, the eating of food, and making food more interesting. It, I think it's, it, it's a mistake to present healthy choices to kids as only healthy choices. Why would you, you know, if but you're I a think kid? That it's would interesting. Be. I think you're raising a great point. The, the science of food is a fascinating mm. book. It's awesome. And if, if it was part of the science curriculum, it would be interesting. If it was part of the biology curriculum. Yeah. How about a course in the chemistry of cooking, college level course, or in medical school? That would be fascinating. Well, they're, at, they're doing that at Harvard. 
So but but if, if, if yeah. high schoolers could take the science of cooking, you would see a lot less Absolutely. sulfur yeah. uh, experiments gone awry and a lot <laughs> more boys cooking, I think. Yeah. Dr. Angelwell, I know you're a great cook, but also I heard that you like to grow your own food. I do. And share with us a little bit about your green thumb, please. <laughs> um, I grew up in a row house in Philadelphia, which had a teeny lawn and a teeny plot of ground in back. But my 